Hello, welcome everybody to the Ant-Man channel. It is Thursday, the 9th of October, 2014. <clears throat> and I'm your host, Ant-Man. Excuse me. Well, I got an article in front of me here from the Christian Post, which seems to be one of the most popular articles or uh, journalist websites that I seem to be going to these days. And for good reason. I think I've been shifted over to addressing... Uh, the church lately, and, um, yeah, I'm gonna get some, you know, this, I'll, whether you make a right decision or a wrong decision, there's gonna be consequences, because people, uh, I don't think they're, uh, walking in tune with the Spirit these days, if they are being caught up by certain types of preachers, and the things that they're talking about, and the fact that they're leaving out the most important issue of all of the gospel, uh, which is sin, Sin is never talked about these days. So, I thought this was a pretty relevant to that topic article that I came across here, that came to my uh, my email um, this morning at 8, 7, 8 07 a.m. Alex Morasco is the, he is the guy that wrote this. Francis Chan at Exponential West, church planners need to set aside a lot of strategies out there to focus on basic gospel message. Bingo. Church urges unity in the church, bringing communion of forefront for evangelism and fruit that lasts. So if you don't know who Francis Chan is, he, I've, I've actually I've, uh, done some studies under him where he's done um, doctrine. He's studied, uh, or he teaches on doctrine and what we believe and why we believe uh, what we believe. It's not really apologetics, it's just really like what is our, what is our basic doctrines for certain things and he is, he's on the money, you know, like there's, you know, a lot of guys out there that'll probably like, <clears throat> probably weird you out, but this guy's on the, he is on the mark, man, when he talks about the things of God. Francis Chan tells thousands of church leaders to get back to the basics of the gospel at the Exponential West Conference held at Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, two days ago, or yeah, two days ago. Um, what do we have going on? When I think about these types of people, I think about like the Daniel Diet, I think about Rick Warren, I think about certain people that write books or they make resources out there for people that are just wastes of time. Why? Because, well, well I see this as a type of hedonism. Hedonism is like when you're trying to think of your own methods and formulas to get the gospel out there. Well, the gospel has a message and it has a has its own, It you know what I mean? The gospel is the gospel and there it's been the same since Jesus has been here and that's the way that we should share it the way that Jesus shared it um, will we ever be as good as he is at sharing it no but we can try and that's what counts um, what they what what's driving these people though is that they are trying to keep up with the church down the street that gets a thousand people to come to church every Sunday and they want to be a big church, and this is uh, this is one of the most sickening things about Christianity today, is that we have pastors that only care about church attendance and people joining programs, and that has nothing to do with anything. Like, your stupid programs are only good for us, you know what I mean? Uh, certain things, man. But like, I mean, it's it, you want to ha give, you want to have the people get a clear message of the gospel, and that's really what's more important. Not like your your formulas and the things that you devise. And we see that a lot these days. And it's all based on their own special interests. And their special interests are, you know, managing their church right so that they can, you know, they want their church to grow. And it's just kind of, I mean, it's good to want your church to grow, right? Duh. But, I mean, the way that they go about doing it, it's like they put the gospel aside to make church relevant and trendy and more appealing to sinners. Well... You, want, you don't want to give the sinner a wrong idea about coming to church for the wrong reasons. I mean, I'm just saying, before I get into this article. Evangelist Francis Chan urges, or he urged, thousands of Christian leaders at the Exponential West Conference to keep it simple in regards to church planning strategy, saying that two things will produce believers, unity in the church and bringing communion back to the forefront. Absolutely. I know there's a lot of strategies out there, but I'm saying for fruit that lasts, I think we need to rethink this, Chan said on Tuesday of the three-day conference hosted at Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, ending Thursday. We are talking about a miracle, and so I'm saying let's abide in Him. Let's seriously believe that we can be one, just as the Father and the Son are one, and pursue that in the church. Yeah, um, it, 
man, sometimes when I think about the first century church and the way that Luke wrote about it in the book of Acts, I get excited, man, because there is a revival coming. And for all you Christians out there that don't want to keep up with the times and you don't want to start addressing controversial issues, you're going to get left behind. And I don't mean that in the Nicolas Cage way. I mean that in the, you're going to miss the boat. And I don't mean that in the Noah way either. Man, what am I trying to say here? Is that you're going to miss the revival. Everybody's going to get on, the, on board with this, uh, you know, pretty much manning up, stepping up to what we're called to do and what Christians really do. And you guys that want to, you know, appease to the homosexual community, tell them that it's okay, you want to fill a church with false converts and not present the gospel of the law and grace, you're going to be exposed by this because nobody's going to jump on board. You're, everyone's going to catch on to you. I guarantee you that there is a revival coming. And there are a lot of Christians out there like, you know, uh, like Mr. Francis Chan, that they, they're, they're going to get the message out there to people. And they're, they're going to be the ones that are going to make real differences in this country. Because your happy-go-lucky, feel-good, nonsense Christianity isn't working. And it's making a lot of people in the church stop people like... I, I'm really trying not to say people like me because I don't want to give myself credit for nothing. I'll just say Ray Comfort. People who go out there and try to evangelize because the people that come in... And then try to stop you are these false convert Christians that tell you that God's nothing but love and that he doesn't, that he's not just. Well, if God wasn't just, he wouldn't be love. How about that? Does it make sense? I think that makes perfect sense. And I don't think that that's unfair to say that if God wasn't just, he wouldn't be loving because he would let innocent people be murdered all the time and they wouldn't have anyone to avenge them. Nobody would have ever avenged Abel's blood. Nobody would ever avenge all the Syrian kids being chopped in half and by, by Islam, militants. What would be the point? He added, let's bring communion back to the forefront of proclaiming his death. I know these things don't seem like they would work, but we are talking about raising the dead, so I think it's our best shot. Chan, author of Crazy Love, overwhelmed by a relentless God, preceded his statement about raising the dead by comparing the miracle that Jesus performed to the transformation that occurs when a non-believer accepts Jesus into his life. When you think about what's going on to reach the lost, there's so many methods. But Jesus said they are going to believe uh, uh, not when you bring. And not. And I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm just saying Jesus didn't say bring this guy in. Bring a famous person to give their testimony. He says when you guys are united, when you are one, something happens. And that's what I was referring to when I said, when I think about the first century church and the book of Acts that Luke wrote about, that he recorded because it actually happened, atheists. Yes, the Bible's a historical narrative of the world events of the first century and beyond. Things that happened a long time ago before that. But the thing that I like that, that Luke wrote about is that the church was, was one of, it was of one accord. People that went to church were actually in step with the Holy Spirit. They weren't, they weren't seekers. They weren't these... You know, I mean, there's always been wheat among the tares and whatnot, but the actual, there were actual more Christians that were actually Christians on fire because nowadays there's like this lukewarmness that comes that uh, comes natural to a lot of Christians. Like they just stay content with the the their relationship with God. Like they don't really pursue God and wanting to know Him more and wanting to understand what He requires of us more. Because man, believe me. I've studied so hard, but I still learn a lot. And it really blows my mind how easily we forget, man. Like, the sin of this world blinds you so easily to be distracted and not see sin as, as, as hard core as God sees it. And that's the danger of not being in step with the Holy Spirit is that you start to become, like, complacent and you start to compromise. And it's all for the sake of comfort and not wanting to be uh, persecuted. It's like the, the article I put up the other day. We want to see, we want to have success, but we don't want to suffer. We want to have God bless us, but we want only for that road to success to be a, a, a straight path with no bumps in it, you know. And, and God usually, to be honest with you, doesn't work that way. Sometimes He disciplines us. Sometimes He uses hardship and adversity to build us up in our character, to get us ready, to put us into a spot of promotion, if you will. Excuse me. Coffee's good this morning. I want us to really think through what we are uh, trying to do, which is raise the dead. And it's not going to happen through our cleverness. He's absolutely right. He emphasized. It's going to happen by men and women being so attached to the vine that the fruits are, are just going to happen. And it's going to happen when men and women called the, called the church 
are they are so united that a miracle happens. Yeah, you guys, it, it's funny how some people will even give themselves credit for conversions and bearing fruit. No, man, if you're in Christ, Christ bears fruit through you. You don't do anything good of yourself. Remember that Jesus Christ said that apart from me, you can do nothing. That's like, that's literal for you guys out there. That's literal. And um, don't give yourself credit for getting people converted. All you did was present the word. You should You should be more pleased that your name is written in heaven than any of your spiritual gifts and i can brag all day about my spiritual gifts but i don't care about them because they're a tool for me to evangelize but i i'm more of i, I brag more like paul says that my name's written in heaven because we have to give glory to god you guys we can't just be like oh huh oh you know what uh you know i don't like kirk cameron or those people is because they don't encourage you to go around putting hands on people and healing them well you know what what was commissioned to the apostles by Jesus Christ isn't necessarily the same thing that was commissioned to us. They were endowed with supernatural powers. But to be honest with you, man, I don't have the... And, and, and sometimes you'll even see that Jesus put... He took people aside before he healed them because he doesn't, he doesn't want to be like, Be well, ah, oh, and everyone clap for me. He knew that it wasn't his time to go and that he'd stir up a lot of trouble by doing stuff like that. And I think that we should take a similar approach that if we even dared to do something as crazy as that, like go make somebody mute talk, you should do it with absolute reverence and, reverence and fasting and prayer. You shouldn't try to just do that thinking you're so godly. And, you know, I mean, those things to me are still a deep mystery of whether you can do that or not. But I don't doubt it. I've been healed supernaturally. I have felt... And actually, I have seen a red glow come off of my skin in worship before. And I, I, I felt as if there was an angel next to me that was worshiping with me, with his arm around me, just praising God. And like I, it was so real. Like I felt like I could touch that angel, but I was so caught up praising God. And the life that was filling me made my, in, it made my body feel like it was vibrating from the inside out. And like my body couldn't contain the life that was in me. That life was making my my skin glow. Like it was making me, a, like there was light coming off of my skin. I know how that sounds, but that really happened. And it overwhelmed me and I, I started crying, like tearing, but I was happy. And I never wanted it to end. But God had, he has shown me supernatural things, man. And it's kind of like, I, I would never doubt that he can do whatever he wants. He could suspend all natural law to make miracles happen. But, you know, um, I wouldn't tempt him. Just for the sake of, you know, it, it's cool when we read stories in the Bible like Joshua. Joshua, he said of the moon and the sun to stand still. And God never had heeded to a man's voice from that day ever, before or after. And do we, can we exercise faith like that? Maybe. Maybe, I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a whole total low. You would only know if you have a personal re relationship with God and if you're growing every day, putting yourself in the Word every day. That's all I can really say about that. I'm not the best person to talk to about this kind of stuff. But I don't deny the power of the Holy Spirit like some people try to say a lot of us classical Christians are. I just think that salvation is a knowledge. It's not some like emotionally attached experience that you've had. You have to have a knowledge of the truth to come to salvation. So that your conscience bears witness to the in light of the law that you need a Savior. That you are fallen. That you are imperfect. That you have broken God's laws. These things bring a person to have a contrite heart and want to repent. And that is the first fruit of salvation, is repentance. And having, having the consciousness that you're in a war. That you want, to be, you want to be feeding the spirit rather than the flesh. You want to be sowing to the spirit rather than to the flesh. Anyways, Chan shared how Christian leaders living outside the U.S. make the observation that Christian leaders in this country are sometimes content with the podcast. We are content with the book. We are content with the sermon. And we are content to take a selfie with someone who has been with Jesus. He explained that leaders should encourage others to have their own mountaintop experiences as Moses did. A movement starts when the founder uh, really knows Jesus. He, he, uh, you know how movements die when the followers only know the founder, Chan said. The Bible says that they are going to believe in Jesus when you are unified. That's how we reach out to the world. I believe in personal evangelism. We have to do that. The future of the church depends on the average person being able to preach the gospel. But I also believe that there is an apologetic in scripture that says the world is going to believe when the church really lives like the church and they become one, he said. That's a, that, that could be something you, you we're going to see in our lifetime. I'm dead serious. I think that we're going to see a gigantic revival like 
some people in history have been privileged to see. Like the Wesleys and, you know, uh, Whitfield. And man, there's so many people that have lived through gigantic moments of church reformation and revival. And, and, and if we get to live through some of that, you know what I would be doing? I would be Bible thumping. I would be Jesus freaking. Because you want to know what? Those are the people that God uses to go out in the corners and preach the word to influence a, 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 an, a, an entire generation. That makes you immortal. Your name is down in history forever. You know, that, that's what kind of stuff that makes me think about. Like, if there's really a revival coming, then you better get ready to be a man of influence. Someone that's going to move people to want to, you know be intrigued more about what our message is. I think that Christianity is so unpopular these days because of the 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 type of people that we're addressing here in this article. The people who are trying to like water down the word and we don't have we don't get any respect anymore because of these people because they're in my opinion too passive and too like non confrontational and too like uh and I don't mean like we need to get into altercations and stuff like that, but we need to fight for God spiritually. We need to say stuff. We need to speak up. Or else we're just like Adam who just stood around and let his wife get deceived and all of that. You know what I mean? We need to be uh, vigilant, defending our faith, pursuing after truth, wanting to get people on board because this is a gigantic message that we carry, is it not? Um... While church leaders and planners may think about many things, they need to have a successful church. Chan believes there should be an emphasis on communion. Like I said, we don't get any respect because we need to be like the church that flourished in the first century. We need to be like the church that that you know that was being raised up to fight in the revolution in 1776. We need to be like these people because these people knew what freedom was worth. They knew that uh, it, it could be easily lost because people can easily lose it. Like, it's freedom isn't free. you got to stand up for what you believe in. you got to be a, a citizen of your country. you got to be a statesman, in a way. you got to be someone who, you know, like, it goes back to the old Roman word virtus, man. you got to be a man of virtue to be able to stand in these times. Because those that don't have the knowledge of God and don't have their feet planted on the rock, man, these people, the Bible says are like the waves of the sea that the wind just blows and to you know from one side to the other and it's true look at how easily people get upset because they want to be tough all they want to be tough guys all the time and they think that that's a that's a that's a manly thing is to lose your temper really easily and show everybody how tough you are that is a that to me doesn't that doesn't represent masculinity that that represents somebody who didn't grow up having a father to be honest with you because you're where do you get your masculinity from? Where do you get that initiation into knowing you're a man from? You get it from your dad. And if your dad wasn't there for you, then ultimately you get it from God. And real men are men of the word. Men are... You're a real man when you commit to study God's word. Quote. Anyway, when we think about proclaiming the gospel, we think about getting a great communicator to proclaim the gospel. But during that time with his disciples, Jesus said, when you take this piece of bread, what? When you break this bread, remembering my body that was broken for you, when you drink this cup with the new covenant, you are proclaiming my death until I return. I'm supposed to preach the gospel by taking communion? That's what he said. All right, that's Francis Chen, you guys. And let's just be, we need to be bold, courageous, and strong men out there, man, Christians. If people aren't going to like us, then we better get them to respect us, straight up. Uh, God bless you. Subscribe to my channel if you like it, and God bless you again. May uh, God favor you and, you know, give you success to all the things you put your hand to today. In Christ we have the victory. Hallelujah.